Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2016 webinar series on the topic of intellectual property, and specifically what hardware innovators need to know. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about our topic today. Hardware innovators and social entrepreneurs are often concerned with intellectual property protection for their products, especially if they have limited experience in this domain and are operating in resource-constrained environments. Planning for the protection of an innovation is an important investment in future success. So, we've invited Dr. Isaac Rutenberg, Senior Lecturer and Director of SIPIT at Strathmore University, Nairobi, to share insights about what legal IP protection options exist and may be suitable for your innovation. We'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us today, Isaac. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinar series team in general. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on our webinar's webpage. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join us in the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit more about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge hub and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. So we invite you to join E4C <clears throat> by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources such as this webinar, opportunities such as jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in our solutions library. Members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. Today's webinar is a collaborative effort with the ASME iShow, a hardware-led social innovation competition open to individuals and organizations taking physical products to market that will have a social impact. Upcoming iShow-sponsored webinars will focus on issues related to hardware-based solutions and, improve and provide practical insights from the iShow expert network. In addition to today's webinar, our next webinar will be on June 14th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the topic will be using crowdfunding to raise capital, and we'll be joined by Indiegogo. On July 12th, we'll be joined by Logro, and the topic will be using the lean business model for social innovation. Check out the E4C professional development page for registration details. If you are already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. We'd love to see where everyone is from today. So, in the chat window, um, which is located right below where you see the participant list, if you don't see that, just click the chat icon on the top right-hand corner. Please type in your location. And I see some folks already typing in the Q&A, so let's go to the chat window. Here I am, I'm in New York, New York, you guys can see it. I can see a number of folks, uh, Montreal, more in New York, we see uh, throughout the United States, Seattle, Arizona, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. We have some folks from Belgium, and I see a lot of folks entering their answers into the Q&A. Again, I'd like to encourage you to please type in any, any uh, comments um, in the chat window. Uh, you can also send a private chat if you have any issues directly to the Engineering for Change admin. Uh, during the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is below the chat, uh, to type in your questions for the presenter. That way we can keep track of them and make sure to address them at the end of the webinar. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the icon on the top right-hand corner. 
If you're listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. So thank you again. We see a lot more folks have entered their answers. Welcome to, from Germany, from Canada, from um, Kenya and California. All over the world, welcome today to the webinar. All right. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions in the top of the E4C professional development page, and the URL is listed on the slide. Now, with that, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Isaac Ruttenberg is a senior lecturer and director of SIPIT of Strathmore University. He received dual bachelor of science degrees in chemistry and mathematics slash computer science from the Colorado School of Mines as well as a PhD in chemistry from the California Institute of Technology. Dr. Rutenberg also obtained a JD from Santa Clara University School of Law. He is registered to practice law in California and also registered to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, Dr. Rutenberg has authored articles for a variety of publications and spoken at numerous conferences in Kenya, primarily focusing on the practical aspects of intellectual property. We're very excited to have you here, um, Isaac, and I turn it over to you to lead us through the webinar. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, so let's get started. Uh, I would like to extend a special welcome to uh, the students from Kenya. That would be Stephanie, one of my students. So uh, I know she's taken my intellectual property class, and I uh, might just call on her for some of the uh, subject matter today. Uh, I should mention that I am fairly informal in the way I typically do presentations, so this is a very uh, different uh, platform for me. Uh, it's my first time doing a webinar, and I, I guess we'll see how it goes. I tend to try and be very interactive in teaching, and so uh, I might stop if you ask questions. I will most likely stop during the presentation and answer them, uh, but certainly we will we'll reserve a lot of time at the end for uh, Q&A. A uh, few other things to note. One is that uh, in Nairobi, I don't know how many of you have ever been here, but uh, it's raining now, and when it rains, uh, one thing you can uh, not exactly count on, but it happens quite frequently, is the power goes out, and when the power goes out, the Internet also does. So uh, if I suddenly drop off the face of the earth, uh, it's most likely for that reason. All right, uh, I've put up my first slide. I hope you can all see it. Uh, this slide is, is a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, in the sense that uh, I obviously do not think engineers are dummies, but uh, in fact I have grown up. My father was an engineer. Uh, I went to the Colorado School of Mines, so I was completely surrounded by engineers. I have great respect for engineers. I think they are some of the smartest people uh, as, a, as of a group. Uh, I, I would actually like to know what kind of engineering you all do. So, uh, you know, if you get a chance, you can type into the chat window what type of engineering. Uh, you know, if we have a lot of, of uh, mechanical engineers and, and no chemical engineers, I, I won't talk anything about chemistry. But, uh, yeah, excellent. Thank you very much for that. Excellent. So as those come rolling in, uh, I'll continue on. Uh, the reason, okay, so let's let's go on to this slide. So the reason I put dummies there is uh, no matter how smart you are, uh, intellectual property can be uh, very unapproachable. And particularly for engineers where uh, you want everything to be very logical, you want it to follow rules, uh, engineering is, 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 is very much like that. Like intellectual property is is not like that. Okay, it does follow rules, but those rules are made by uh, lawmakers. And there are two things for which you do not want to know how they're made. One of them is sausages, and the other is law. Uh, and this is certainly uh, what an example of that. So for the next hour, or however long we're speaking, uh, don't assume this is all going to make sense, because a lot of it doesn't. And don't assume it's logical. Don't assume that people really thought this through and had 
the best interest of anybody in, in mind other than perhaps the, those making the laws or those with the most money who could influence the people making the laws uh, because most of that doesn't apply. This is, uh, this is, this is uh, sometimes quite difficult to follow and, and does not make sense. So don't, if, if that's how you're feeling, uh, definitely do not feel alone. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll try and we'll try and make this as, as straightforward as possible. Uh, the other thing to note is that you know I've, I've studied this for, for many many years, and I teach this at uh, an introductory undergraduate level, and and also I will be starting a master's level class uh, course on intellectual property. Uh, we spend hours and hours and hours. Uh, in learning any one of these particular topics, which I'm going to introduce to you and glance over, essentially. So, uh, by no means will will this be exhaustive, uh, even as an introductory level. This is this is not at all in, uh, exhaustive. So, but I, that all said, I hope you will at least uh, get something from this. And and as I mentioned, questions are really uh, very welcome because you know best what issues you're facing. Uh, I could talk for, on this for hours, but uh, maybe it's not as helpful as if uh, you asked me specific questions. So with that in mind, uh, oh, okay, a few more background issues. Uh, one is that uh, intellectual property is not really about technology. I mean, it is at some level, but uh, it's more about the law, and, and the law will say one thing the technology you might be able to argue is is a great technology, uh, and, and various aspects of it should be covered by intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera. But if that doesn't fall within the law, it doesn't matter. You really, uh, with law, it's it's really you ought to go buy the book. Uh, there's something called black letter law for all of us lawyers. By the way, if any of you are lawyers, uh, please do let me know in the comments. Uh, I don't I don't expect anyone to be, but if you are. Or if you have a, a you know a strong background in intellectual property, you can let me know. I don't expect that. But um, then, lastly, uh, this does not say anything. What I'm going to discuss does not say anything about the quality of inventions, of products, of, of anything really. Intellectual property is not usually about the quality, uh, particularly patents. The patent a patent doesn't say you have a good invention. It only says you have uh, a patentable invention. Now I see someone is attending, uh, planning to be attending law school. That's excellent. Uh, so, so if if you know if someone comes to me and they say I've got this this fantastic invention, uh, I've just spent five years of my life in in developing it. It's going to revolutionize the world. It's brilliant, et cetera, et cetera. The hardest thing for me to do, and I have to do this frequently, is tell them I'm sorry, it's not patentable uh, for whatever reason, and usually it has nothing to do with the quality, but more about the law and specifics in the law, it's really quite difficult to tell someone who's just spent so much time that their invention is not patentable, but they have to understand that it has nothing to do with quality, that has to do with law. All right. Uh, I fancy myself as an amateur astronomer, uh, so I'm going to take a uh, an analogy here, we are going to start with the, the view from Earth. Uh, so this is the view of the moon from 200,000 miles away um, through obviously a, a reasonably good telescope. And I'm going to ask the question, why? Why are we doing this intellectual property thing? Well, uh, at the 200,000 mile view, the answer why is, is, is really about control. This is, we are talking about control. Who controls uh, what it is that you create? These are creations of the mind. Intellectual property is all um, property in the sense, but in the sense of uh, creations of your mind. It's usually intangible property, although uh, in most cases it would lead to something tangible. For example, a patented process would lead to a product, and that product uh, is tangible, obviously but the, the method of making it is, is intangible. Uh, but what we're talking about really is control. Who controls that property? Uh, however you want to define the property, 
that's what we're looking at is is what who can we control in in the way they use it uh who gets that control and and uh generally speaking the ones being controlled are well you a lot those who are not holding the intellectual property so the general public uh the other engineers other other inventors uh, the, the one who holds the, the, the patent can control others who just do not hold the patent. Uh, and, and finally, also at the end of the day, it's also a lot about who holds the money. So employers end up with a lot of control, and we will talk about that uh, more in depth. So you, you are on Earth. You can see we're now talking about control. What if we get closer? Here is the, the view from uh, Apollo 10 as they were circling on the moon. Uh, this is the 10 mile view. And now we would want to ask uh, again, why are we doing this intellectual property thing? And in theory, uh, control, this control that we have, that we have in, instituted, this legal control, provides benefits. Um, benefits include incentives for more uh, invention, more creation, uh, et cetera. Uh, well, yeah, to make money, exactly. But uh, an incentive is, is can be money. An incentive can be, oh, you you control this property, so now you can go make money. So now you should go and create more intellectual property, so you can make more money, et cetera, et cetera. So in theory, it's supposed to incentivize creation and invention, um, and then. The other side of the coin is that the general public is, in theory, supposed to benefit as well, uh, and particularly from uh, well, from patents. The, the the way the general public benefits is that in order to get a patent, you have to disclose what it is you're doing. You have to tell the whole world what it is and how it is you're doing that patented invention. So, in theory, uh, the the general public, and meaning everybody in the world benefits from the presence of patents because you can go and look up how it is that the, the state of the art is being done. So there's, uh, there's transparency of inventions, etc. Uh, there are other justifications for other types of intellectual property, but, uh, but let's just leave it at uh, everybody is supposed, to pro is supposed to benefit somehow. These are balancing uh, acts done by lawmakers to try and uh, incentivize disclosure, incentivize innovation, uh, incentivize good products, and in return, uh, you know, the, the general public is, is supposed to get uh, benefits as well. So uh, I see someone is mentioning a uh, slogan would be trademarked. That is true. We will get to that for sure, uh, for sure. So lastly, uh, Apollo, I think this was from Apollo 14, uh, landed on the moon. But now, why are we doing this at the micro level, uh, the surface view? Uh, well, th so if you think you can think of the surface view as, as, as a couple of things. One is the uh, personal level. Why would you, as an individual, want to patent anything or, or get any intellectual property? Uh, one is a sense of fairness. You know, you work really hard. You create something really unique, interesting, helpful to the world. So perhaps uh, this this property is is a bit of a reward for hard work, and it's also recognition. And so, you know, there are a lot of different ways of creating, there are a lot of different uh, uh, ways of inventing, and so a lot of different intellectual properties start popping up. Uh, and and these are sort of flags or stakes in the ground of of claiming specific property uh, specific areas of property. One would be patents. Uh, which I've mentioned already, maybe copyrights is another, uh, trademarks, uh, trade secrets, know-how. I'm going to describe uh, most of these five. Then some more esoteric versions, design patents, uh, integrated circuit masks might be relevant to some of you. Uh, traditional knowledge, probably not so relevant to, to you, but certainly in Kenya it's a hot topic. Genetic resources, again, very hot topic here. Uh, technovations, you probably have never heard of these. Uh, they're really only in developing countries, and so I won't really talk about those. Uh, plant varieties, those are becoming more and more important. Uh, 
So lots and lots of uh, in types of intellectual property, and these really are only, uh, I wouldn't say these are ex exhaustive at, at all. Uh, you know, law lawmakers love to make laws, so, so they make all types of interesting intellectual property, uh, and uh, each one of these is really just created out of essentially nothing, right? The, the law is created, and all of a sudden you have uh, a new type of property. Uh, Technovations is a perfect example of that. Uh, it didn't exist for a long time, and some law came along, and now all of a sudden you're getting people claiming that they have Technovations, and nobody even knows what they are. And certainly no one cared before the law came along. So, uh, so it's an interesting process. Anyway, let's go on. Do not be afraid. People have gone this path before, before you, uh, before me. Uh, there are people who have done this. So uh, with all of those different types, you can still understand what we're talking about, uh, maybe not fully, but enough to, to be dangerous. All right. Another question we should ask. Okay, so I saw a lot of people were from America. That's great, the United States. Um, this, is, this, this section is very specific to you, although in other, in other countries this is going to be you know, fairly similar. Uh, in our Constitution, the United States Constitution, Article 1, which tells about the powers of Congress, uh, Section 8 says, to promote the progress of science and useful arts, Congress has the power of securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusion, exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. This is the basis for patents and copyrights, right here. Uh, and it's, it couldn't be any more basic, it couldn't be any more well-grounded than in the Constitution, the original Constitution. It's not even in any of the amendments, it's right there. Uh, it's like the physical embodiments, manufacturing, okay, I'll get to that in patent law, so I'm coming to that. Uh, to, the, to this comment that I just saw. So anyway, Congress uh, is the next level, and Congress passes laws. They pass the patent law, they pass the copyright law, they pass trade secret laws. In fact, that's right before the president this week or next week. Uh, they, they, they create these laws, although I should also mention that some state-level laws can also be uh, created. That, that involved uh, intellectual property, very few, but some, and, and most of this is federal law. Uh, so here's the Patent and Trademark Office, their seal. They administer all of uh, uh, what, what we would call industrial property, so property that is useful as opposed to copyrights, which uh, are, are more creative works, not intending to insult uh, artists that their work is not useful, but uh, it's generally not considered to be industrial property uh, useful on an industrial level. Uh, then after that, you get more uh, international. There's the World Intellectual Property Organization, and uh, that doesn't grant patents or uh, trademarks. Those are all done on cop on a national level, but it does uh, it does interface with the national offices. Uh, then the World Trade Organization is also very important through an international treaty. Uh, and finally, we end up in the courts. So these are all the people who are involved, the levels who are involved. Uh, and of course, Shakespeare says, um, let's kill all the lawyers. Uh, hopefully not myself included. I, I'm, I'm a scientist first. But, uh, you know, lawyers do tend to muck things up. Uh, and that's uh, certainly what's, what we've got. But I would have to say the worst offenders in all of intellectual property are the journalists. Uh, no offense if there are any journalists in the audience, but I cannot tell you the number of times I've read an article where they meant to say trademark or copyright, and they said patent or vice versa or any of that. They get these, all these intellectual property terms are completely uh, in, used interchangeably, and, and by no means are they interchangeable. They cover completely different things. They have completely different rules, uh, and journalists tend not to care. So. Don't say I, I don't try not to get your news from your intellectual property training from newspapers. Uh, those are the worst sources. I would rather you read Wikipedia, which tends to be much more accurate than, than newspapers or journalists. Um, but of course, uh, I'll, I'll give some some better resources at the end of the presentation. All right. 
So on to a specific type of intellectual property, uh, and this one being very specific to patents, or sorry, to technology, that being patents. Uh, patents are all about technology. Uh, in fact, if something is not useful, you can't get a patent on it. So it has to be a, usually what's called a solution into a technical problem. Or there are various different ways of, of saying that, but uh, but in general, patents only refer, only deal with uh, technology. So I've give, I'm going to give you a few examples so you can understand uh, what was patented. Uh, I'm an amateur radio operator, so Morse code. Uh, well, back in the day, we had to learn Morse code. I don't even think you have to do that anymore. But anyway, this was uh, the first telegraph key. Uh, which people used to use for, for sending Morse code. Uh, and that, that was patented back in 1881. Uh, let's see, 17 years is the original duration. Uh, you're correct. Uh, well, actually, I'll get to that in just a bit. Uh, and I'll address the comments that are coming in the chat. Keep them coming, though. I do, I do appreciate that. Uh, after 1881, not too much longer, the airplane, believe it or not, was patented. Uh, this was the uh, Orville, Wilbur, and Orville and Wright, uh, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, their patents here, shown here. Uh, then, I don't know if you've heard of Engelbert, uh, Douglas, I think was his first name. Uh, he invented, okay, based on many others going before him, but he is generally considered to be the inventor of the computer mouse. And as you can see here in 1970, uh, he, he obtained a patent for the mouse. Now, uh, I've given you some fairly uh, disruptive technologies, or, or maybe not disruptive, but incredibly important technologies. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be so important to get a patent, uh, and the technology doesn't have to necessarily be so critical to society. Uh, anybody can get a patent for almost anything, as long as it's a technical solution, or or technology, here we have Michael Jackson. Um, you may remember back uh, when he was performing, uh, he had a particular song where he would lean far, very, very far forward, and so far forward that it looks like he was about to fall, but he never, of course, did fall. Uh, and then he would straighten back up to, to, uh, or, uh, or to standing straight up and down. Well. Michael Jackson was, was good, but he was not that good. Uh, he was not beyond the laws of physics. And in fact, uh, gravity did apply even to him. But he patented a way of doing this. Uh, and you can see next to the picture of Michael there, I've got a picture from his patent, this being uh, one of the drawings. And uh, basically, there, were a, there was a little clip inside of his shoe, which, which meshed with a little clip inside of the stage. Uh, if you go back and look at those videos, you can see that the stage goes dark for a second, and then the sign, the, the lights come up, and uh, you can see him leaning forward. So what he was doing was sticking his feet into the, the clips there. So we all know how he did it because the patent tells the story. Uh, but for 17 years, or roughly 17 years, only he was the only one who had the ability to make that. All right. How do you get a patent? And I'm going to accelerate now because we're uh, actually taking longer than I expected. You, you write an application. Uh, in the application, I, I notice, uh, actually, let me back, oh, yeah. In the application, I noticed someone just mentioned claims. That is correct. Basically, uh, what you patent is a, a single sentence which describes your invention, and it's called a claim. And that claim gives the boundaries of, of your invention. So uh, at the end of every patent, and you can go and find millions of these online, you'll find a section called claims. And that's really what's uh, in that, that. That is what is patented. So in an infringement proceeding, they'll look at the claims, they'll look at the, the product, and they'll see if they match. Uh, and those are also what's examined. So the claims are, are looked at by the patent office for the various requirements of patenting, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. And if they pass that, then you get grant. Uh, the patent office says, here's your patent. Uh, you can go now and enforce it. You can take people to court. And then people who you claim are doing your invention, if what they are doing matches what you have claimed and what has been granted uh, as a claim, then you can collect damages. 
And finally, after a specific amount of time, in the United States, this time is 20 years from the initial filing date. So it used to be 17 years from the grant, the date it was granted, but it's now, yeah, it's now 20 years, and this is fairly standard around the world because of international treaties. It's now 20 years from the original filing date. Uh, so if it takes five years to get through the patent office, your patent term is basically 15 years. If it goes through in one or two years, you get eight, more than 17 years. All right. Uh, you, what can you patent? You can patent products, uh, which includes formulations. So this is, this is uh, machinery, this is chemistry, chemical formulations, this is specific compounds. Uh, you can patent methods of using any of the above, methods of manufacturing any of the above. Uh, and you can patent software, sort of. There's, uh, I, I noticed some of you are software engineers. Uh, by far, or computer engineers, I should say, uh, by far, you know, software is the most complicated, <laughs> I would say, uh, in, in this, and I really don't want to get too deep into it until I see a question from someone, and then I, and then I will. But, but just be aware that there are probably more software patents, or what we call software patents, than any other in terms of number, uh, in terms of actual importance. I, I, don't, I don't think it's... Um, quite the same, but uh, someone is asking for a patent on a method of use. Absolutely. So a really good example of that would be in pharmaceuticals, uh, and my particular favorite example is uh, a particular blue pill, a triangular blue pill, as I recall, uh, that are, are used for uh, sexual dysfunction, that being Viagra, of course. Well, the original Viagra is actually a compound called sildenafil, and the original use for sildenafil was as a heart medication. It made your vessel, your blood vessels, uh, dilate. Uh, so uh, that was seen as good for the heart. They were giving people the medication in trials for heart medicine, uh, heart conditions, and then they noticed a curious side effect. Uh, which the smart people at the pharmaceutical company said, oh, well, we could patent that too. And so they pa obtained a patent for a different method of use of a compound that was already known. Uh, so you can say a method of treating a human being by using a chemical, the, the compound sildenafil. That's the classic uh, method of use. Some of those <clears throat> are not actually used in you're welcome. Thank, uh, some of those are not allowed in other countries. You can't use, you can't do method of treatments of human bodies in a lot of countries. But lawyers are clever and they always find a way around that. So uh, it's not really worth mentioning. <clears throat> All right. How do you qualify for a patent? Uh, you have to satisfy these three criteria in the United States. Um, and most, well, any country that has a straight patent will have these three criteria. Novelty, inventive step, or in the United States it's called non-obviousness, and industrially useful. Uh, in some countries there is what's called a utility model or a petty patent, in which case you just delete the second requirement. It only needs to be novel and useful. Novel is very low standard, so anything that's new in any way at all, if it's different from the prior art, if in any way, it's, it's good. You're good. Inventive step requires something more. It has to be not just inventive, but new. Uh, but Sorry, not just new, but, but actually significantly different from what went before. All right, moving on. Uh, trade secrets must, so, this, so think also technology. Anything that could be patented most likely can also become a trade secret. As long as there was, is some effort to keep it secret, and it has some value for being secret. You can get a trade secret on it. And it's sort of a misnomer to say you can get a trade secret. It is a trade secret until you, uh, until you lose it, really, until someone discloses it. Coca-Cola is widely believed, popularly believed, to be the most valuable trade secret. I would highly disagree with that. Uh, it's, mo it's really only valuable because of the lore of Coca-Cola being a trade secret. The far more valuable part of Coca-Cola is the trademark, but it, we can argue that and anyway. Uh, things you can trade secret are generally technologies and other aspects of business, such as customer data. 
uh, or customers, customer lists, data about them, uh, providers of, of services, uh, various things like that. That sort of information that you took an effort to collect and you take an effort to keep secret, and it's value because, valuable because it is secret, that stuff you can get trade secrets over. Uh, now, staying with technology for a little while longer, we have know-how, which is a little different from, tech, from trade secrets. Imagine, if you will, you tell people, I'm going to now patent the method of making bread. Uh, I take flour, salt, yeast, and water, I mix them together, and I add heat, and you get this beautiful loaf of bread. Well, the first loaf of bread is probably not going to look so beautiful, and, you know, pretty much other people who come along and read your patent, uh, you patented this idea, flour, yeast, salt, water, uh, combine heat, and uh, combine them with heat and I get bread, the first loaves will come out, okay, maybe not so pretty, uh, maybe you over the bread was rose a little too much and then fell, maybe you cooked it a little bit too long, uh, maybe you cooked it a little lot too long. But anyway, the know-how would be exactly what temperature produces the best bread. All of these are bread. Okay, maybe the last one is, is, is beyond bread now. It's more charcoal, but uh, they, you have bread everywhere here, essentially. It may not be the best bread, but if you want to know how to make the best bread, you have to go to the people who filed the patent application, and they may have created some best practices after the filing, which worked really in the patent. So that's technical know-how. All right, uh, I'm going to get to copyrights. Let me let me look at these questions that have come in real quickly. Uh, okay, on the for, on the question of assignment, uh, I'm going to cover ownership at the very end. And on hardware and software off the shelf, can we patent the process and the outcome? Uh, generally, no. Uh, but uh, but let me see if uh, the rest of this answers these questions, and then I'll come back to that. So copyrights, we've talked about patents. That covers useful stuff. I'm going to run through the last few slides in, in just a few minutes so that we have more time for questions. But copyrights are a mess, and the reason that they're a mess is because they're automatic and they're immediate for anything you create that's creative and falls within the categories I've listed here, books, plays, painting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any of this stuff that you create is automatically and immediately protected by copyright. So all of us own copyrights, and a lot of copyrights, in fact. Um, probably in the hundreds, by the time you get into college, you own hundreds of copyrights. Uh, that also includes any software you make. Um, and so, you know, it can become a, a real mess when you get all these property rights that you didn't even ask for, uh, there's really no, it's very difficult to not get copyrights. So people go out and they sue over, over copyrights a lot and, and it's just quite a mess. But anyway, these are the types of things that are covered with copyrights. And just think in, in your head, it's got to be creative. Music, plays, books, okay, computer software is creative in the way it's written. Uh, so, uh, so all of these fall under copyright. So, uh, and then finally, as a, as a form that I'm going to cover, and as I mentioned, there were many other forms, but uh, this is the last one. Branding, if you create a business and you want to sell a product, sometimes much more important than the product is actually the branding. And a lot of these companies, as you'll see here, spend a lot more on the branding and the advertisement than they do on the product itself. So trademarks, service marks, trade dress, design patents, et cetera, et cetera, social media, all of that stuff uh, falls under branding, and, and in many ways, it's super important. Uh, now, for those of you in the U.S., uh, you might know what I'm, what I'm referring to here. What is really important about branding? Uh, well, I can go on to the next slide. Uh, goodwill. Good, goodwill or goodwill uh, is very important for your brand. You want to have goodwill amongst your uh, audience, your consumer, and then uh, hopefully you, you'll sell more products that way. The opposite of that uh, might be certain companies that have really actually given us a perfect example of how you lose goodwill. 
And so they're uh, sort of a textbook example uh, that you can now understand goodwill through. All right. Uh, social media, another way of, of, of branding, of being uh, innovative, unique. Uh, and, and social media to me and to, to, to SIPIT, the center that I direct, we consider social media to be an intellectual property. It's very often, it's, very, it's almost indistinguishable in terms of form and function from a trademark. So, uh, you know, you have to be very careful with how your company, if you start, if you spin off a company or you, you create a company, be very careful with your social media. Uh, Korean Airways felt um, this was an appropriate tweet, and the people of Kenya um, certainly did not feel this was an appropriate tweet. Uh, KitchenAid, and I'll just let you read these. KitchenAid uh, apologized after after this tweet about Obama. Uh, I don't know why a company would ever say anything like that, but they did. And of course, anything on the internet is is forever. You cannot delete it because people take pictures of it and retweet it, etc. So, and then finally, uh, this I had never heard of Parley uh, Agro Private Limited in Mumbai, but uh, they were the target of this. Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty horrible thing that someone did. They tweeted this about their product, and then they lost. Uh, it was retweeted like 55,000 times within a few minutes, and then they lost a lot of. Uh, and this actually affected their business. They lost a lot of business because of this. So they sued. Uh, naturally, they sued Facebook. They couldn't find who tweeted it. It was a, an anonymous account. Uh, they ended up suing Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and you know that never works. So. Uh, there's something called a, um, uh, well, there's an exclusion for ISPs and OSPs uh, for liability. So it didn't work, but uh, but that's the sort of thing that can happen. All right. I think this is the last topic, well, essentially the last topic, and that is ownership. Uh, now, there are two things to keep in mind. Inventors and authors are for different things. Inventors are for patents. Authors are for copyrights. Uh, and basically, they are the first owners of whatever it is that is patented or copyrighted. But they may not be the last owners, or the uh, or the immediate second owner might happen immediately. Right? So an author might write something, and then the, the copyright might transfer immediately to their employer. Typically, this happens with employers, employees. If you are an employee, essentially. Everything you create within the job description, certainly, but uh, okay, let's stick within the job description. All of that is belong it belongs to your owner, to your sorry, to, is owned by your employee employer. Uh, so follow the money. Who is paying you to do this invention, or to do this creative work? And if they're paying you to do it, under most circumstances, this is particularly true in Kenya and and and. Uh, a lot of uh, developing countries, uh, the, the owner is the employer or the contractor. Uh, in America, the rules are slightly less strict on that, so in some cases, authors end up owning. But basically, when you become an employee, you don't expect to uh, own what you create. Uh, and then also, all of this can be modified by contract. Uh, if you contract with your employer or your contractor differently than the law says, then your contract controls. And, uh, you know, that, that is something that doesn't happen very often, but, uh, but certainly can. All right. Oh, and the employer might have the right to file patents in any case. So even before you've applied for a patent, your employer might be the one who is the only one authorized to file. And if they don't file, then you, they, you might get the right. But generally speaking, it's the employer who has the right to file. Uh, data ownership can become extremely complicated. Who owns your data? What data is it? Where did it come from? How was it generated, et cetera, et cetera? Sometimes copyrights cover databases. In Kenya, they certainly do. Uh, and so collections of data might be copyrighted. In which case, the, who is the owner of that? Might be the author, might be the employer, et cetera. Might be portions within a database that are owned by different people. It can be very complicated. Ownership is one of the most complicated. Open source 
uh, and I'm going to blo block that with Creative Commons. These are both referring to the same thing, essentially. These are ways of licensing, of giving people the right to do things with your, in, with your copyrighted works. So open source, there are dozens of different open source licenses. They say different things. They allow people to do different things and have different requirements of the outcome. So someone mentioned uh, with off-the-shelf hardware and software, particularly software, uh, can you patent processes and outcomes? Well, uh, aside from patenting, you may not be able to, depending on if it's open source or not, you may not be able to create uh, con uh, proprietary software. You may or may not be able to. You may have to relicense it under the same open source soft, uh, uh, license. Uh, aside from all that, you know, uh, the outcome needs to be unique. Uh, and now I'm answering the specific question of can you patent a process and outcome from off-the-shelf stuff. Uh, if it's new, if whatever the outcome is new and was, as I mentioned before, was non, is non-obvious in the U.S. So the likelihood of that is, is probably pretty low, but I could, I could see it being a possibility if you're using it in a different way. All right, uh, these are things that make you go, hmm, for those of you who are older than 30, I think you might, you might know this person here. Uh, okay, a few, sorry, a few last things. IP can go very far. Uh, I mentioned who owns data. This is a picture of a, far, a modern farming tractor somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, they basically punch into computers where they are. What the, actually, the computers tell them what to, the farmer, what to plant and where to plant. They actually, the computers, based on the huge databases of data, tell the computer on the farming equipment what to plant and where to plant. And it's just, it's really quite incredible if you, if you, if you look into what is essentially the most basic of human behaviors, farming, it has now become absolutely incredibly complicated and data driven. And as I mentioned, data ownership is complicated. Farmers don't want to release data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you've got machines being controlled by software. Uh, you can't control, you cannot modify those machines because those uh, software are protected by copyright. Uh, this is actually a screenshot from a computer farming simulator, simulator game. Uh, so it can go a little far. Um, some people say it can go way, way too far. And I would, uh, I would tend to agree with that on, on some level. Uh, and then finally, uh, IP can go extremely wrong as well. This is a patent that was granted to uh, some inventors from a university in the United States basically using turmeric, turmeric, the spice, the root, essentially in wound healing. This had been done for generations in India, and it was eventually withdrawn uh, and validated as a patent, but the patent office in the U.S. thought it was good enough, at least initially. Uh, so, all right. These are some resources. Uh, Basically, these are national patent offices, international regional patent offices. WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Law. PIPA, P-I-I-P-A, Public Interest International, Public Interest Intellectual Property Advisors, and CIPIT, our organization. And most of the pictures I provided in this presentation, I did not obtain the rights to put into a presentation. Uh, so please come and visit me in jail. Uh, I'm only kidding, of course, because most of this, you know, I'm pretty sure this would be covered under what's called a fair use or fair dealing, depending on which country you're in. So, uh, anyway, I'm happy to take questions now, and I'll go through now the chat and, and answer as much as I can. And also, you you are allowed. I do not mind if you email questions. Thank you so much, Isaac. That was very, very thorough. And of course, we already have uh, some questions coming in into the Q&A and I encourage everybody to please uh, enter your questions to, to the Q&A area so we can keep track of them. So I'm um, not sure if you addressed this deeply, uh, but uh, there was a question that came to the chat very early on on how does IPR apply to physical embodiments, i.e. is manufacturing and artisanal production covered by contract law or copyright law? So the physical product, if the product itself is is new, uh, for example, a 
uh, a medical device that's never been built before, that would be a patented device. Uh, okay. If you're thinking more of uh, uh, carvings, the product itself is not new, but the manufacturing method might be new, in which case the method might be patentable. Uh, the um, the the product itself might also, if it has sculpt, if it if it has no useful uh, okay, this gets a little complicated, but sometimes the product itself might be co covered under copyright, uh, particularly sculptures. So soapstone carvings, for example, are very popular in Kenya. If you've got a machine that's making soapstone carvings, each of those carvings at the end of the day is copyrighted as a, as a sculpture. So uh, there are lots of different ways it might be covered. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> another question that has come in is, uh, from one of our listeners who's interested in getting any suggestions when there is a developed world company owns the IP for something that this individual would like to use in the developing world context. Is there anything that they should be aware of and understand in terms of, uh, of, of applying that IP? I'm not quite sure where this question is going, but uh, well, let's see. Mm. So first of all, you should understand that uh, all intellectual property is is essentially uh, region, national, um, regional. In other words, a patent in the United States is not valid anywhere outside of the United States. Uh, that does not apply to copyright, though. Uh, copyrights are valid outside of the country in which they were originated. But let's stick with patents. So if you are a developed world if you're a company in the United States and you patent something in the United States, uh, anyone in the developing world can, in theory, create the same product and not have to pay you royalties. Uh, but, of course, if their product ends up getting to the United States and being sold there, then that's a problem. But as long as it stays in those other countries, they, they have the right to do that. Uh, if you patent in those other countries as well, you can then exclude them that way uh, and, and, and uh, so it can be a very extensive process to do that, and most people don't. They, they, would, they would pick a few very important countries, and then outside of those few important countries, it's really a free-for-all, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. But that's why there's also what's called know-how, which I described. So the patent mm -hmm. might describe the invention, but not the best way of making it necessarily. So you know, one way of, 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 of dealing with this is that you license the know-how in addition to the patent in all countries or in specific countries, even where there aren't patents. That might be something that can happen. Very interesting. So kind of building on that, uh, another listener had a question relative to uh, the geographical constraints and if there are different applications for multinational patents, if those exist? So there, uh, there are a few. Uh, the United States is not party to any of them. There are two re regional, what we call regional organizations in, in Africa. One is uh, for English-speaking countries and one is for uh, French-speaking countries. And then there's the European Union. There's also one in Asia that's, that's fairly small. But those are the only uh, international, what I would call international patents, and they only cover the countries that are party, party to those pre regional treaties. Uh, there is no such thing as an international patent. There is an international patent application that's called the PCT or Patent Cooperation Treaty uh, application, and that is oftentimes mistakenly called an international patent, uh, but it doesn't give you any patent rights at all. It only gives you an application which you can then convert into national applications. Hmm. So another tricky question has come in, and I, I think this one is going to be interesting, but what is the best time for a product or concept to go for a patent? Since at startup stage, a lot of things change rapidly until the first version is finalized. Yes, that is uh, the sixty-four thousand dollar question, <laughs> and uh, every single and every single case is different. But the general rule is you want to patent it after you have made significant enough development in the product to know uh, to be able to describe it thoroughly be able to explain to uh, the skilled artist in the, the, the audience, basically, which is, which is someone of ordinary skill, uh, how to make and use your invention. Uh, uh, and it has to be the final invention that you're going to be marketing, hope, hopefully. Uh, but not 
do not wait so long that you you have one of two things or a few things happen. Possibly someone uh, patents it ahead of you, and we have a first to file system. So if you wait too long, someone might get to the patent office first, uh, or someone else discloses that invention either accidentally or intentionally. Uh, based on what you've told them or based on independent research. So once someone tells the world what it is that you're doing or what they're doing and it's the same as what you're doing, that potentially removes your ability to patent. So it's always a very tricky uh, analysis, and there's definitely no uh, one answer. But I, I guess the only one answer would be consult a, an intellectual property, a patent lawyer. <laughs> <They'll tell you laughs> if it's too early. If it's too early, they'll tell you, and if it's too late, they'll tell you. Well, luckily, we have one on the webinar right now, so you know where to find one there. Um, exactly. Uh, one, <laughs> uh, a few more questions have come in, and um, I think we'll only probably have time for those two. Uh, so um, question regarding the know-how, and is know-how patentable? And in your bread example, if someone patents, quote, unquote, bread, but not the production method, can I patent my better way to make bread using the same ingredients as listed on the original patent? Okay, so you've actually asked two questions. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. One is, uh, uh, can you patent a method for making bread if the original patent only said the ingredients to making bread? Mm -hmm. First of all, you wouldn't have an original patent that only gives the ingredients because the patent has to disclose how to make and use the invention. And if you say, here are the ingredients for bread, but you don't say how to make it, uh, even with a, you know, if you don't say anything about how to make it, that's not a valid patent and it would not, theoretically would not be allowed by the patent office. You have to at least give one uh, plausible way of making bread in your patent. Now, you may not have given the best way. Maybe you didn't know that there was a better way. Maybe you have only baked your bread at 300 degrees, but it, you find out after you filed the application that the best way is actually to bake it at 350. Then you can go back and patent the additional information potentially if that additional information satisfies certain rules. It has to be, uh, you know, you have to do it carefully and again consult a lawyer for this, but it's possible to patent the know-how. It's a very, un I wouldn't say uncommon, but it, it's more common to keep the know-how as something you license with the patent itself. And, and that's generally because there are so many things that go into an invention. Uh, you just can't keep going back to the patent office and filing and filing and filing. And most of that mm -hmm. stuff is not going to be patentable anyway. It's, it's more of a product uh, optimization. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. And I think we're going we're gonna to hit our last question here. Would you kind of discuss the possibility of someone else patenting your novel but unpatented product even though you have previously sold the product? Can open source or Creative Commons protect from this possibility? Yes. So uh, let's see. The uh, the patenting process is not required to sell a product uh, ever. But mm -hmm. so you don't have to have a product a patent to sell something. But mm -hmm. someone else might patent something that prevents you from selling your product. And if they were the first to the patent office and they filed their application before you made public the same invention, mm -hmm. then they would get a patent and they would be able to exclude you from making it. But if they uh, filed their application after you had already been selling your product, and what you've been doing is call, is referred to in patentees, it's referred to as prior art. You have mm -hmm. basically precluded them from filing a patent application because you've already disclosed to the world this invention. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this theoretic, the theoretical reason for having patents is to encourage people to disclose their inventions. If it's already out there in the public domain, there's no need to do that. So the law says that once you have put it on for sale, if no one else has filed an application by that date, uh, in theory at least, you would be able to knock out their patent. It would, it would, you would prevent them from getting a patent and therefore prevent them from stopping you from selling, continuing to sell. Duly noted. So with, with that, we're going to wrap up the webinar. And I, I'd like to thank you, uh, Isaac, for joining us today, uh, for sharing your extensive knowledge and your 90s references uh, with all of us. 
Um, and I'd like to thank all of our attendees. If we didn't cover your question, we did have Isaac's email up earlier. If you didn't catch that, then please do feel free to follow up with us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. For those of you who are seeking professional development hours, please uh, note the code listed on this slide when applying. And I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us again. And don't forget to become E4C members to get information on our upcoming webinars. For those of you who are interested in the recording, we will post it in a few days. And you can feel free to share it. No patent required. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Isaac. And have a fantastic morning, evening, or afternoon, depending where you are. And we look forward to catching you on the next E4C webinar. Bye-bye.